so that we may return to the truth and sin no more. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It looks better here we are together. Yes. 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 We, are, we are not being Catholic, we are not scattered. Catholics love to be scattered. <laughs> so do we have all, all of us have the notes, right? Okay. So we begin on page 152. Basically, we are going to look at grace and freedom. By the way, did you get the book I told you about? Good, this is the book. Okay. Please, please, if you can get it. It's, it's a very good book. Okay. And of course, the picture says it all. This picture here, the garden solution. The man is sitting on a branch up in, on the tree and he's cutting it. He's cutting the branch and he's sitting. Okay. Okay. He's very wise. You are sitting on a branch and cutting it. Okay? It shows that you, you are not thinking. You, know, you depend on God and you say he doesn't exist. Okay? So it's, it's a very good book, please buy it. It's not heavy reading. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's understandable. So, <laughs> so it's, it's a very good book. It helps us basically to put things in perspective because as Catholics, oftentimes we don't know how to rebuttal atheism. Well, even Protestants, but more so the atheism. Their arguments look on the surface very intelligent, but once you basically analyze everything, their arguments are very foolish. Okay? There's no intelligence behind it. They think they're very intelligent people. It's in this book where they give basically that example of a you know, printing press explosion and things like that. It's, uh, it's well written, so it helps us to see the shallowness of atheistic arguments. Okay. Atheists every day live in contradiction to their own teachings. Mm -hmm. Can you go back over there so mm -hmm. the camera can get you filmed? Regardless of illusion. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, this. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this, this book is, is very good. The authors are Patrick Madrid, most of us know him. I don't know this other one, Kenneth Hensley. Yeah, Kenneth Hensley, it's co-author. From his little biography in the back cover, mm. inside back cover, yeah. he's written a lot. Yes, he has written, but I've never heard of him. But it's a, it's a very, very good book. Remember, this is in reaction to um, Dawkins' book, which is The God Delusion. Okay. Dawkins, and you know, in his book, you know, he calls himself a very intelligent man, Dawkins. But when you read his book, The God Delusion, it's uh, you don't see any intelligence behind the book. But when you read this book, and you see that these are solid people who know the atheistic arguments. They put it very well, the naturalistic argument, the arguments of the atheists. Okay? And then they start tearing them apart one by one. Okay? So it's very good to have this book, The Godless Delusion. And a man is dressed so well. <laughs> he looks like a nice guy, you know, intelligent, but he's extremely dumb. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's, it's a good book. Okay, now we are going to look at grace and freedom. So grace is God's gift given to us to basically influence the will. So if the will is influenced, is the will free? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Depends on who's influencing you. <laughs> so that's what we are going to get into. Okay? Because remember a man called Pelagius, okay, who said that we don't really need grace okay, as something internal to act on the will. Because if grace acts on the will to influence it, then the will is not free. So he said all we need is the gift of free will to do God's will. But remember what we said about that is this, that God's grace is supernatural and the free will is a natural gift. 
So you cannot use a natural thing to basically receive something supernatural. You need to be uplifted, to be given a supernatural gift, life, in order to receive supernatural gifts. Okay, so Pelagius was wrong. So that's uh, in line with what we're going to look at today, grace and freedom. The question we're now asking, the question we're now asking is to what extent the human will remains free under the influence of grace. We proceed by asking three questions. Number one, can grace be truly sufficient and yet inefficacious? That if God offers us sufficient grace, can that grace be like in vain if it is sufficient? <coughs> no. Yes. It's your choice. Okay, so number two. So basically understand the questions very well, okay? Okay, so number two. <coughs> Can God bestow graces which antecedently are infallibly efficacious? Yes. Yes. So the question would be then, if they are antecedently, infallibly efficacious, so is the will free? Yes. Yes. If God has antecedently determined it to be efficacious, infallibly? Yes. Yes. Okay. How does the human will remain truly free under the influence of efficacious grace? God has already determined that it's going to be efficacious. It's going to bring about its effect. So is the will free in operating under those circumstances? So those are the questions we're asking. So can grace be truly sufficient and yet inefficacious? The reformers... Mm -hmm, Remember the so-called reformers, we call them reformers historically, okay? But they are, in terms of the faith, they were actually <laughs> deformers. They deformed the faith. So in terms of the faith, there's nothing you can refer to as reformatory about what they did. Now, during that time, there were good people who did good reform. But historically, they are not the ones we call reformers, okay? The people we call reformers are Martin Luther, who else? Calvin? Calvin. Zwingli. Okay. They are the people we call reformers. But when you look at their teachings, they deformed the faith. So we just call them reformers historically, but in actual fact, those three didn't reform the faith in any way. They basically deformed it. So the reformers and the Jansenists denied the grace that grace can be truly sufficient and yet failed to win the consent of the creature. Their view was that grace, if it is truly grace, always brings consent. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Are they right? Yes. Well, that was the case we know the 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 if economy. grace, if it is just, just to think about this, okay, their view is that if it is truly grace, it will always bring about consent. Eve would not have taken the fruit if that moon grew. Because Eve had every grace, but she used her free will grace to, to decide to, to disobey. Grace took away the free will, then. So if grace takes away free will, then it's, it's, it's not, not grace. Right. Right. <laughs> Be grace, okay? As the ancient idiom says, grace builds on nature. Hmm? Okay, so look at, so their view was that grace, if it is truly grace, always brings consent. But is that true? No. 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 So if that is true, then the Catholic Church is wrong. And the reformers are right. Hmm? So, so these questions can really be, a com uh, rather these uh, uh, things can be really confusing if we just hear it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Okay? But, you know, we're going to see that. Uh, we. So the human creature is not free to resist the all-powerful grace of God. Is that it true? No. Yes. Human creatures every day resist the grace of God. Yes. Correct. 
Okay. Okay. So the fact that I, I fall into sin doesn't mean that God is not providing the grace. Otherwise, there wouldn't be need for salvation in the sense we have it in Christ Jesus. Because if every time I sin is God's fault, because he has not provided, provided the grace, why would God send me to hell if it is his fault that he's not providing the grace I need? God, I'm sinning, but you know, you, you didn't. You didn't deliver, so. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. You see the danger <laughs> of looking at things from this. So, so, so in, from this uh, point of view, Lutheran point of view, Martin Luther, whatever, was doing the point of view, you can sin all the way you want, any way you want, but there will be no consequences. Why? Because it's not your fault. It is the devil's fault. The devil got to you before God. He beat God. If you do good, it's really not your credit, God is doing it. Because he came first. He beat the devil. You remember that in his called so Babylonian cap captivity, Luther wrote that we are like a horse. Okay? We have no say. If it is early morning and the devil comes first and mounts the horse, then I will do evil. If the next day God comes first, I will do good. But I have no say because I have no free will. Why? Because original sin totally destroyed free will. That will be Luther's point of view. But we said no. Okay? Because why, did, why didn't grace destroy free will? It weakened it, okay? You know, distorted it, but it didn't totally destroy free will. Why? Sin, original sin, did not destroy, totally didn't destroy free will. It weakened it, okay? Distorted it, but not fully destroying it. Why? Pardon? And? No, the question is, we say, the Catholic Church, Luther taught that original sin totally corrupted free will. And the Catholic Church says no. Gra original sin did not co totally corrupt free will. What did original sin bring about? Yeah. It brought about loss of sanctifying grace. Okay? What is sanctifying grace? It's a God's life, okay? So that's what we lost. So why didn't the loss of sanctifying grace totally corrupt the human will, free will? It's very important to remember these things, okay, the basics. The reason is, free will is a natural gift and a sanctifying grace a supernatural gift. So loss of a supernatural gift does not necessarily result into loss of a natural gift. So that's why the Catholic Church teaches that free will was not totally corrupted by the loss of sanctifying grace by original sin. Because when we, our parents sinned, they lost the life of God, to which basically they didn't have a claim. Okay? It wasn't natural. It was a supernatural gift. So the natural gifts remain. That's why you re recognize that people like even atheists, okay? people don't believe in God, even the most evil people, they, they still have the gift of reason. They still, still have the gift of free will. That's why the church <coughs> encourages us to preach conversion to them. <coughs> because they still have those natural gifts, okay? which can be influenced, assisted by grace, to turn to God. Otherwise, if that were not the case, if some, or someone is in mortal sin or a pagan, there's no need to preach to them. By the way, does the church have an active obligation to convert Jews? Yes. Yeah. 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 Jesus. God said, "Rich in the blood." Hmm. Jews and Gentiles alike. There's an obligation to teach. Have you, have you some of you have uh, have you seen the uh, the document which came from you know the Vatican? It was just a uh, they they call it. Um, a dialogue between Catholics and Jews. Have you heard about it? I've heard about it. And what it says? I've heard what it says. 
Okay. So does the church have an active? It's good that I remember that. <laughs> does the church have an active role to convert Jews? Teach. To convert. Well, yes. the Bible the doesn't believe in convert. Jesus Christ, it's our responsibility as Christians to at least convert people. So where do you go for, where do we go for answers? Paul. Google. 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 <laughs> Paul. It's <laughs> going through months, not Google. You go to Google. <laughs> okay. Let's look at scripture, what scripture says. Because you know that there's some of the things <laughs> it's so disturbing why why people come up with things <laughs> when in actual fact they think it's so clear. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew, okay. The last remember that uh, what is really going to destroy us is this so-called political correctness okay and the idea of we have to get along we have to find you know compromise on certain whatever it, it's, it's like we 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 all cowardly okay? so matthew chapter 28 does the church have an active mission toward the jews to convert them so Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. This is the mandate of Jesus. Okay? Are we there? Yep. Yeah. The 11 disciples went to Galilee. Why 11? Because Judas hung himself. Okay, Judas was dead. Okay. <laughs> to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. You know, like many of us. Okay. Okay. Then Jesus, this is important, then Jesus approached and said to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What does that mean? All power, it doesn't say some power. All power has been given to me. Therefore, by that same power, okay, go, therefore, that's the meaning of the therefore, okay? Go, therefore. Okay, with the power, my power. Okay, we will see. We see that again in John chapter twenty. Okay, go therefore and make disciples of all nations except Jews. <laughs> no, all nations. Period. Oh. Does it say that? No, it says all nations. Period. Nope. All nations. There is no exemption. Okay. Okay. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How do Jews baptize? How do they baptize? So if it is the mandate of Jesus Christ to the disciples who were Jewish men, Jesus was a Jew, Okay? Sending them to make disciples of all nations without exemption, including Israel, okay? to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What is Jesus telling the church? Actively to go and convert everybody. That is the mission of the church. Okay? How do Jews baptize? They don't. So there are some disturbing things in our day and age, okay? They say, well, this is not a doctrinal document, but it's based on reflection on doctrine. You know, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Okay, so we see Jesus sending the church. This is the mission of the church. It's to everybody, not to some, okay? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, all. Okay. And behold, I'm with you always until the end of the age, okay. the end of time. So because if they don't believe in Jesus as, as the Messiah, so they can't baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son, whom they don't acknowledge as true God. But this is the mandate of the one who believed true God and true man to all nations. The mission of the church is to all nations. 
Jesus didn't say, well, Jews in the, will find a way in the old covenant, and he didn't say that. Because he is the fulfillment. <coughs> okay? So, how did the apostles practice this? How did they understand it? Let's go to the book of Acts. So when you hear things, okay, Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Are we there? Okay. So chapter 1, let's begin with verse 14. This is very, very significant. Okay? That's why St. Augustine, every time, and of course other people like St. Irenaeus, every time they encountered you know, people who told things and whatever, they went back to the basics, the word of God. What does God say to us? You can go into your theological speculation, into your economical, you know, ecumenical dialogues and come up with things, but if they are not best, on scripture, it is wrong. Period. If it's not based on divine revelation, where do you get what you teach? Okay. So Peter's speech at Pentecost. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice. So this is the church teaching now. Okay. As they understood the mission entrusted to them by Jesus Christ, all power in heaven has been given to me. Go therefore, I entrust my power to you. Okay? And teach all nations. So now they are teaching. And where was Peter at Pentecost? Oh. He was in India. Mm. 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 Peter at Pentecost. He was in Rome. He was in Rome. Jerusalem. No. no. He was in Jerusalem. Okay? Yes. So what was this preaching to? To the Gentiles? No, no. no. Okay, so listen. Listen, the, the mission of the church, okay, to the people of, the basically, in the Jewish land, okay? The, then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and he proclaimed to them, You who are Jews, okay? This is the mission of the church to the Jews. So where this document, guys, I, I, I don't know. You who are Jews, indeed all of you staying in Jerusalem. So that's the setting. That's where he was. Okay? Let this be known to you and listen to my words. This is the authority of Christ. Listen to my words. He doesn't say, Anna, oh, no, please, you know, I appeal to you. I mean, okay? There's no apology. Okay? Listen to me. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. But it is only nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last days, God says, that I will pour out a portion of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Okay? This is not the American dream, okay? This is a different dream. Indeed, upon my servants and my handmaids, I will pour out a portion of my spirit in those days. They, will, they shall prophesy. And I will work wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and a cloud of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and splendid day of the Lord. This is a prophecy from Joy. And it shall be that everyone shall be saved who calls on the name of the Lord. Everyone calling on the name of the Lord. We, we talked about that this morning. Okay? David calling upon the name of the Lord, meaning to enter into covenant relationship with the Lord and grow in that relationship. Knowledge, okay, of the one who is calling us because he has revealed himself to us. 
So you who are Israelites, hear these words. Jesus ne the Nazarene. Okay? What does that mean? He's from Nazareth. Pardon? He's from Nazareth. No. Look at the word. It's, it doesn't look like Nazareth. <laughs> okay, look it up. Okay? It's not Nazareth. Uh -huh. Nazarene. Who, who are those? The Nazareans. John the Baptist followers. That's your assignment. Yeah, it <laughs> okay, look it up. It's not Jesus like the Nazar from Nazareth. No, it means something else. Okay? Jesus the Nazarene, Nazarene was a man or a man. Now this remember, Peter is teaching Jews here. Okay? You who are Jews. Okay? Jesus the Nazarene was a man commended to you by God with mighty deeds, wonders, and signs, which God worked through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Okay? They, these people Peter is preaching to, they saw Jesus, and many of them had seen the signs, meaning the miracles. Okay? This man, delivered up by the, by the set plan and for knowledge of God, you killed he doesn't say, oh, you know, he, he was killed. No, you. You killed him, okay? You killed using lawless men to crucify him. Who are the lawless men? Romans. Uh -huh, the, the Romans, okay? But God raised him up, releasing him from the throes of death because it was impossible for him to be held by it. He is God, his life himself. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, with him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Therefore my heart has been glad, and my tongue has exalted. My flesh too will dwell in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to the nether world, nor will you suffer, nor will you suffer your holy one to see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So he continues, my brothers, one can confidently say that you, about the patriarch David, that he died and was buried, and his tomb is in our midst to this day. But since was a prophet and knew that God has sworn an oath to him that he would set no will set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that neither was he abandoned to the nether world, nor did his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus. Of this we are all witnesses. We saw him after he died, okay? So Peter says, exalted at the right hand of God. What do we mean by right hand of God? The right hand of God means the majesty and glory of God. Mm -hmm. He received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father and poured it forth, as you both see and hear. Okay, this is the fruits of that Spirit he has poured. Peter is saying, For David did not go up into heaven, but he himself said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, Peter continues, let the whole house of Israel know for certain, okay, there's no doubt, for certain that God has made him both Lord and the Messiah, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they asked Peter and the other apostles, what are we to do, my brothers? And Peter replied, the church has no active mission to the Jews. <laughs> no. Repent and be baptized. What did Peter say? Repent and be baptized. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, some of you. <laughs> Every one of you. <laughs> Every one of you. Okay? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name, the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
For the promise is made to you and to your children and to all those far off, whomever the Lord our God will call. Amen. So where do these men get these? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are some confused people in the valley. Yes. That's true. Yeah? Okay. So yeah. they the, yeah. yeah. Friday, the the church. Church. Mm -hmm. It's yes. very plain, the whole church does. Yes, it's, 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 it's very plain, okay? Yeah. The reason being, okay, that the call to mission is to everyone. So if you say that the church doesn't have an active role to convert Jews because they was you know they are the covenant people, whatever, then what is the concept of the new Israel? So, so, so this is that's why we need you know to study the fathers of the church. Okay. These were men filled with wisdom. I told you some of them, like Polycarp, Ignatius of Antioch, Saint Irenaeus, Saint Augustine. They, they, especially those fathers who lived in the first century, you not know, the second century. Okay? You know, Clement of Rome, Paul. Um, Ignatius of Antioch, yes. We have um, Irenaeus, okay. All those, okay. They are very, very important, okay. We said because of their proximity to the apostles, but because of the heresies that came during the second century. That's why it's very important to study a person like Saint Irenaeus. They always went back to the scriptures and the teachings of the apostles. That was their first line of defense. Theological speculation came later. Okay. The first line of defense for the faith is the word of God and the teaching of the apostles. So if you hear these things, Peter himself speaking to the Jews that they must be, they should be baptized in the name of Jesus. That is how the church expresses its mission to the Jewish people. And someone comes 2,000 years later and says, the church doesn't have an active mission to convert Jews. <coughs> no. It goes back to the beginning. And we do. When you say convert, it seems to me that you're saying that you're going to pull into their head something up. No. To teach. To teach, to yeah. call them to yeah. conversion. Yeah. Because the teaching yeah. is intended for conversion. Yeah. Okay? You know, some will convert, some will not. not. Right. Okay? But it would be very... Um, it's like jeopardizing the faith of a particular group of people, the salvation of a particular group of people, to tell them, in an essence, that we don't really have an active mission to teach to you yeah. Christ Jesus, yeah. so that you may convert to him. Well, we do have that. Yes, because... We saw it. Yes. Jesus telling them to go to all nations. And we see Peter starting with the Jews. And all will believe. Okay? So, Did you the say basics. that came out of the Vatican? That yeah. teaching that proclamation? Yes, there's a document yeah. talking about mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. dialogue between Jews and Catholics. The Catholic Church. Well, doesn't somebody review it before that goes out? Well, the... The head, like so. <laughs> you don't have to... You, if you tell someone, have... It's this idea of don't offend anybody. Somebody can look it up, okay? You can look it up on... Mm -hmm. Smartphone or... <coughs> you say the book. Okay, but... So, the, the essence of the thing is that we have living proof, okay? That all nations are called to conversion. And therefore, the church has an active mission toward each and every nation without exemption. And you'll see the apostles doing that, starting with those who they say crucified the, the Christ. What should we do? Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus. So, there is no confusion, there is no doubt. The confusion is brought about by 
us who complicate very simple things. <laughs> we love to complicate things for no good reason. It's, it's very easy. It's, it's, it's easy. Okay. So, their view, the reformers, was that it's, if, if it's truly really grace, grace always brings consent. The human creature is not free to resist the all-powerful grace of God. In effect, they denied that the human will remains free under the influence of grace. Okay, so basically taking it from Luther. Okay? That if God offers the grace, we will just do it, just being used as a tool, okay? as, a, as a horse. We don't have a say in it. What does Holy Scripture say? Okay? So we're going to look at Holy Scripture. Again, we always go back to the basics. Because if you don't start with God's revelation, then where do you start? You're going to commit heresy if you don't start with the Word of God. Okay, this is not philosophy. Okay? This is theology. It's divine revelation. So we begin with a divine statement, not our own thinking. Okay? In philosophy, we may begin with our own thinking. Okay? That's what philosophy is. But theology is we begin with a revealed statement, a revealed word of God. So, so the question is the same question. Where did these men get this? Okay. To say that if it is truly grace, it will always bring about consent. The human creature is not free to resist the all-powerful grace of God. Where do they get this from? From their thinking. Their own, their own thinking. You know. okay. From their, their own thinking. Is that really what God says? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that grace can be truly sufficient and yet without effect is shown by the fact that scripture complains that humans fail to repent. Even after God has supplied them with abundant help. Okay. So where do we go? Let's uh, Go to Isaiah 5. Let's begin there. That's a classic in of text. Isaiah chapter 5. Beginning with verse 1. The song of the vineyard. So here, basically, the setting is that God had planted a vineyard and he used choicest seeds and choicest soils. So there was no problem from God's point of view. He did everything right. First, Isaiah chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. He did everything right. He supplied everything that was needed for the vines to bear fruit. He supplied everything. Okay? But to his surprise, they didn't. Okay, so listen to the text. Let me now sing of my friend, my friend's song concerning his vineyard. This friend is basically God. Okay? My friend had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He spared it, cleared it of stones, and planted the choicest vines. So there is no defect in God's grace. That's what it means. There is no defect in God's grace. Okay? It's Perfect, choices divines. Within it, he built a watchtower and healed out a wine press. Then he took, he looked for the crop of grapes, but what it yielded was wild grapes. God did everything right, but the vines did bear wild grapes. Yeah, like we do all the time. God expects us to be patient, kind, forgiving, gentle, self-control, faithful, and so on and so forth. And we bear grip, wild grapes. Say, so where did this come from? It didn't come from your baptism. Oh, sure, God, it did. No. <laughs> it did. It did. So now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah meaning now the church, we, okay? Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done? That is God speaking. 
I did everything. Okay? Why, when I looked for the crop of grapes, did, I, did it bring forth wild grapes? He did everything for Israel, just as he does everything for his church. And yet, we produce something else. Now I will let you know what I mean to do to my vineyard. Take away its hedge, give it to grazing, break through its wall, let it be trampled. Yes, I will make it a ruin. It shall not be pruned or hauled, but overgrown with thorns and briars. I will command the clouds not to send rain upon it. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his cherished cherished plant. He looked for judgment in injustice, okay? Judgment, but see bloodshed. Okay, he was looking for justice, whatever, bloodshed. For justice, but hug the outcry, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the wars began. War, war, war to you, war to whatever. So, that is a clear indication okay, that God did everything, but because of the will of humans, they decided to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. So the prophet depicts Israel as a vineyard for which the owner God has done everything possible to make it bear fruit. He cleared it of stones, sped it, sped it, again. it planted choicest vines, protected it from wild animals, he built a fence around it. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done? And the answer is nothing. And yet, despite, despite all that God had done, the vineyard did not yield good fruit. The grace offered Israel was surely sufficient. Otherwise, God wouldn't demand what he did not plan. Okay. God cannot demand from us what he has not be, basically made us capable of doing. Whatever he demands from us, he has made us capable of being able to do and to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So the grace offered Israel was surely sufficient, but without good results. In the New Testament, Jesus reproached Chorazin and Bethsaida, you remember that text again, okay? and Capernaum, Kephanaum, as well, because they did not repent. Now, Kephanaum was his hometown. That's where he basically lived, okay? And they did not repent. Why would Jesus condemn the cities he didn't provide sufficient grace to? Mm -hmm. Because they did not repent, even though Jesus had done mighty deeds in these towns, which should have brought the people to repentance. If the same mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, these are pagan cities, okay? The people of these cities would have reformed their lives long before. Clearly the grace given to Chorazin, Bethsaida, and the Capernaum was truly sufficient and yet without the desired effect. Let's look at the text itself, okay? Matthew 11. So you see the importance of going back to the basics. Because there you get the right answers. So you can't be confused about anything because it is God's teaching. So he says, a man, a man means like in truth. Okay? In the truth I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Okay? So from the days, okay? And then he goes on, okay? Okay? So he goes on to praise John and John. And then going to verse 20, okay? Then he began to reproach the towns where most of his mighty deeds had been done. Most. Kapharanaum, Kephanaum. Most of his deeds were done there. 
since they had not repented. Walk to you, Chorazin, walk to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would long ago have repented in sackcloth and ashes, as the people of Nineveh did when Jonah went and preached. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for these pagan towns of Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Why? These towns would say, well, you didn't give us enough grace. No, I gave you enough grace and you did not respond to it. Okay? And as for you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will go down to the nether world. For if the mighty deeds done in your midst had been done in Sodom, imagine that, Sodom. If what was done in Capernaum were done in Sodom, it would have remained until today. Those people would have repented. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Okay, but by him saying that, though, he's telling the people also they would have done good. No, this basically, it's a, it, all this teaching is intended to again convert those people to realize that they are being obstinate of heart. Their hearts are callous. So this basically strong, these strong words in the biblical language is called a judgment oracle. They are being used against them to crack open their stubborn hearts so that they too may be saved. But again, some will continue to resist. Some will crack open. Like the people Peter preached to. So what should we do? Their hearts were basically cut open. What should we do? So it doesn't mean that every time a person refuses to repent, that the grace is not sufficient. That God hasn't provided enough for their salvation. So it's God to blame, not the person. No. It's always, the problem is always <coughs> on our side. God has done everything he needs to do for us and for our salvation. Now it's up to us to respond to the power of his grace. But we have free will. God is not going to force us to do things. So grace is given sufficiently to everyone for salvation. Some embrace it, some reject it. As we see scripture telling us. What chapter are you in? Um, chapter 11 of the Gospel of Matthew. Yeah, it's, it's there in the notes. Okay? In the Matthew some, 11, 20, 24. But some people argue that mm. God knows our will even before we know it. Right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, well, I know I know I have free will, but um, said, so, "Well, I'll do." You know, God knew I was going to. God do knows the way He way, made but us. But you don't know. Yeah, you know? God knows the way He made us. Yeah. Yeah, and He knows everything. Yeah. Okay, because He sees instantaneously, contemporaneously. You know everything. He knows everything. Okay, and He knows us, and that's why He offers the grace for our redemption. Okay? And he knows we're going to choose wrong. We are going to see that. It's, it's in the notes. It's coming. <laughs> yes, it's coming. But the bottom, the thing is that he knows us so well. Okay? As he tells Jeremiah, even before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. So there's nothing that takes God by surprise. Okay? He knows everything. But the way he made us is who we are as human beings. If we didn't have the gift of free will, we wouldn't be human beings. So that is the gift of being human. But as you know, that we take the greatest gift God has given to us and we abuse it. Yeah. Now the abuse of the gift doesn't mean that the gift is not good. It is, free will is very good. It's what makes us truly human. But unfortunately, 